And welcome viewer! Last week we covered Brenton Tarrant's Christchurch Manifesto and detailed his assessment of the problem space and his solution. To provide practical solutions to real problems, we need an accurate assessment of what is real. Lauren Southern's 2019 documentary Borderless was a natural follow-up for us. Her investigative reporting and her team's uh, EU speech chronicled the efforts of the migrant crisis, the effects of the migrant crisis on Europeans and the refugees giving us more accurate information on the symptoms and the causes to judge Brenton's solution and alternatives. We will remain sympathetic to all parties involved. We will be bipartisan in this, unlike many other coverage of these issues. So who are we? I'm Ben, uh, Australian and founder of Beverly, and I'm joined by Cricket. Uh, please tell me I pronounced that right. Um, a Norwegian composer, musician, and amateur philosopher. Together, we are part of every an open community to transform isolated and competitive wisdom into collaborative wisdom through weekly discussions like this and software projects that facilitate them. So an overview of what we will be discussing today, we will give a brief recap of last week's episode, discussing Brenton's manifesto, the problem space, and his proposed solution. Then we'll go into Southern's documentary her team's observations, and a more accurate assessment of the problem and its solution space with practical solutions we can talk about and actually adopt, uh, which was something missing at the end of our Brenton live stream, uh, the practical side of it. So what are our motivations going in? Uh, so personally, uh, yeah, I, we've covered propaganda recently on the Beverly Channel. Uh, then we got into the manifestos of the Unabomber and then uh, Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch. Uh, shooter and uh we found uh there wasn't really any good bipartisan or sympathetic uh coverage of it i s looked on youtube i couldn't find anything i actually went back afterwards applied a filter for over 20 minutes i found like 12 different things uh and out of the seven i watched uh they were all incredibly dismissive um and i don't feel that's the correct solution to address the issues that are rightfully raised um that need to be talked about. Um, so this is our presentation for it and and our opportunity to really address what's what's going on in a way that no one else is kind of doing. Um, Trigiv, over to you to introduce your objectives. Yeah, so I didn't catch the previous meeting, but I definitely think that addressing people on their terms is important if you have to come to any understanding. I therefore think it's important to make sure we understand the consequences and true depths of the problems that concern people and the solutions that are proposed, even on the far right. Right. Uh, alrighty. So, uh, so what was Brenton's uh, assessment of the situation and his proposed solution? So, it, pretty much, his manifesto begins with "It's the birth rates. It's the birth rates. It's the birth rates," which is a true observation. Uh, there is no uh, majority white country uh, that is having a uh, meeting the reproductive number uh, for a sustained population. Um, whereas there is many different countries all over the world, which is far exceeding uh, the the reproductive number. So like above the reproductive number is 2.1. So 2.1 children um, on average per uh, per person um, or per relationship. I think maybe per person. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, per, per, per yeah, I don't know. Yeah, per couple, uh, per reproductive couple, I guess. And yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, he was very concerned with that uh, and then with the uh, emigration from other nations into white uh, countries and as a uh, white nationalist or rather as his terms, he was a eco-fascist which uh, requires um, ethno-nationalism in his worldview. Um, so he felt... Uh, not only threatened uh, that white culture was threatened um, by migration, but also that the environment was also threatened by migration. We do a very detailed analysis, myself and John Buck, uh, on his uh, assessment in our previous live stream, so check that out. Uh, but this one, we're just giving a summary. So his solution was to reduce demand for migration and get them to move back. Um, by making them fear being in the Western world, uh, by increasing terrorist attacks against them, and by ruining opportunities by increasing instability overall. So kind of bring the increased political instability uh, all around, 
um, increase terror in migrants, reduce demand for that supply of migrants into the West. Now, our criticism uh, against that, which we pre presented, was I it, largely it's going to be infeasible because you still run into a lot of scarcity problems. Um, Europe has had scarcity issues all uh, throughout its Europe. That's why there's many different countries rather than just one country um, and battles throughout them. So to some extent, the countries in Europe, they're based on contextual cultures um, and self-governance, which is true. Um, but also it's a result of centuries of battles to create those cultures around matters of how do we manage scarcity. So even if there's only white people in the rest of the world, you're still going to have situations where every now and then scarcity will arise. Um, so there needs to be ways of managing that. And you will still have cultural conflicts within white culture as well. Um, we can see this um, sows of division happening across between liberals and uh, conservatives or right leaning, like the right and the left. So unless you plan to kill everyone who disagrees with you, which the left can also do, uh, then you're not going to uh, succeed in creating that eventual stability that conservatives uh, desire. Trigger, yeah. have you had something to add to that as well? Yeah, I, I've been seeing the summary of Brendan's proposed solution because, again, I wasn't there for the previous uh, meeting. I I wrote uh, I wrote this of note. Instability is generally unfavorable as it makes everything less reliable. Fair doesn't just go one way. Therefore, even if you think the solution is reasonable, it should not be not be the favorite solution unless absolutely desperate, as the cure might be worse than the disease. Insofar as terror attacks are committed both by and against migrants, and opportunities are ruined for everyone, alternatives that don't ruin opportunities, that don't generate fear, that don't make people more prone to act in short-term self-interest over long-term, are preferable and should be pursued over a better solution. From a game theory perspective, we should regard society in terms of equilibria. Generally, we can either have an equilibrium that favors forgiveness because there's so little cheating that it is rarely punished, which is generally more effective at accomplishing any set goal, as people don't have to expend costs to punish very often. Or we can have an equilibrium where forgiveness is punished, which entails a lot of punishment and distrust as people take advantage of others at nearly every turn. In the latter, efficiency only exists in closed subcultures. In the short term, it is beneficial for the individual to, to engage in cheating in those. But in the long term, it's detrimental to everyone. As Brenton's solution pursues instability and fear, it encourages decision-making that would push for this latter kind of equilibrium. This kind of equilibrium is to a large extent responsible for making migrants want to emigrate from the countries in the first place, and is not in any way desirable for one's own country. This is all without considering the migrant's ability to go back should he be able to make them want to do so. If they've gotten tricked into what amounts to slavery, this might not be their choice to make. Cool. Uh, and if that was a mouthful, uh, the show notes are in the description below. Uh, so for anyone who wants to read it, they can follow up uh, with the show notes of what we're discussing in the link below. Uh, you'll find the discussion forum and the agenda and also our forum. You can participate. These meetings happen every week. Also leave the YouTube comments because this is a community we're trying to uh, facilitate this discussion. It's very important to move from isolated wisdom to collaborative wisdom. So what were the documentary takeaways? Uh, pretty much, uh, so, or rather, what was the summary of the documentary? So Lauren Southern and her team, um, they, they went uh, to Europe and then they went to, you know, try to find out the assessment of the issue. And then they went to where the border, the migrants were actually crossing the border. And then from there, they, you know, interviewed a whole bunch of people and actually realized like even in Turkey where the migrants were initially coming in, it's actually even affecting the Turkish people quite severely. It's made their communities quite unsafe with a lot of these illegal immigrants um, crossing over, um, as well as just how it's affected the economy. Because uh, when it, there's illegal immigrants, there are, the way that they get there isn't by planes legally. It is via traffickers. That is a very important discussion, uh, distinction. And illegal immigrants are generally done in Europe through traffickers. Very important argument that we'll bring up later. So then from there, after realizing, okay, there's a traffic uh, issue, they went to one of the um, uh, camps, uh, an island of Greece, and where there was uh, several thousand immigrants uh, there when it was only meant to house like a 1,000, I think. It was completely overpopulated. So therefore, again, issues of scarcity arise. 
um, and the immigrants were, uh, you know, just waiting to get into Europe. Uh, and there was also a large scale um, of even terrorism on the island. Uh, ISIS was rampant on the island as well. Um, and people who had honest intentions um, were also getting taken advantage of and abused. Um, people who were atheists were being killed uh, and all sorts. It was just whenever scarcity is introduced, uh, you now need to make decisions of who eats and who dies. Um, and it's not, it's not a nice situation. And then after that, they got talking, they found, okay, there's actually corruption with a lot of these NGOs. The NGOs are actually working with the traffickers. Like, how do the traffickers know when to arrive on time? It's um, NGO cooperation. And so then they started targeting NGOs. They found several of them who were actually participating in corruption. Um, and they documented that. And uh, they were highly acknowledged and applauded for their efforts here. Um, what they brought to light actually resulted in successful prosecutions. Um, and from there, they then went into Morocco um, and uh, went to one of the uh, camps just before the migrants uh, crossed the border. Uh, and then from there also realized like a lot of them are just, you know, kids or teens or young adults who have honest dreams. They, they thought Europe was the promised land where they could get work. It was welcoming. It would provide a nice future for them. There was one boy who wanted to just play on a soccer team. They had this view of Europe as being this uh, amazing place of abundance that was able to provide for them against the huge, tremendous scarcity they faced back home and the instability. So a lot of them had genuine desires to move over. Now, it, now she does present. It's like, well, even though they uh, have these honest ambitions, um, or sorry, sincere ambitions, uh, benign ambitions, uh, should they still have the right to immigrate? Um, and that's now presented uh, as a follow-up into Ireland and also through some other areas in Europe where they show the effects of uh, mass importation or mass migration, uh, immigration into an area now causing scarcity for the local population. So in many communities where there has now been migrants imported, um, now the communities are now no longer able to even provide what well, they were struggling to provide for the lower class before. But now they're definitely struggling to provide for the lower class. The, the uh, native population has been displaced to make way for the migrant population because there's a lot more charity going towards migrants than there is going to the local homeless. Um, and uh, it followed up with Ireland, how one of the hotels um, that was needed to house uh, the local community was repurposed as a migrant hotel just because it was more profitable because of NGO involvement because of government uh, involvement because of whatever else and it kind of transformed the community so you started having um, this Irish politician who was very much pro uh, like very much cared and won awards for taking care of refugees um, actually saying like look as much as we personally care for refugees importing them is creating scarcity that is displacing and, and impoverishing our own people um, that is real. Now, it's not just a matter of scarcity of jobs. It's also scarcity of resources, scarcity of accommodation, scarcity of transport, scarcity of infrastructure, scarcity of food, all these different things. Uh, there's a finite amount of resources and capitalism works very well uh, for scaling resources appropriately uh, to consumers. It starts off high price uh, and then lowest price uh, from so the upper class can pay high prices and then the economies of scale kicked in, uh, kick in to make it more affordable because you start off with a niche where it's uh, low supply, um, low demand, so high prices um, for the elite class of so like the way Tesla scales. And then um, the more you can make that funnel bigger, so the available audience, um, the available demand, then the more money you can eventually have. Uh, but it requires time to build the infrastructure to achieve that scale. Um, so people can watch Elon Musk's master plan uh, for kind of an introduction to the economics of scale, um, if they wish. And so you have these issues uh, there. And she actually said, like, uh, this politician, while she really cares about it, yeah, we need to, we need to solve these issues. So uh, with that, 
Uh, that's kind of the summary of the Borlas movie. Uh, they Lauren also presented a speech to the EU uh, with a politician who's in the thumbnail, which I have. I will recall the name uh, while uh, Trigiv is doing his talking points. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, um, but uh, yeah, she was uh, had a summary in the talk, uh, the EU talk, and really campaigning for for uh, the complexity and the delicacy that these issues uh, demand. And it was actually a very interesting talk. There was a Q and A at the end. You had um, like. A, uh, what would you call it? The Muslim priest, priest is the right word, but the Muslim version of a priest, uh, imam. you know, blessing the, yeah, Iman, uh, blessing the work of Southern and document uh, describing these issues. Because this is one of, so now we're talking to like part of the issue, right? Like, like if we just bake this down to race, we're actually losing um, a lot of the complexity, right? So people don't just hate races because they look different across. They hate races, or the reason why they hate people who look different from us is because of some underlying reason. The the hating for superficial reasons is a symptom of something else, um, and that symptom it can be widespread. But generally, it's just down to scarcity. There is a lack of resources and how to go. Um, uh, Trick of, do you have anything to add while I read over the notes? See if I forgot everything. Yeah. Um, uh, so. One of, one of the consequences of the migration that that was very evident in Norway about uh, five years ago was that uh, the sheer quantity of migrants couldn't be followed up by the system. There simply wasn't enough manpower to keep up with it. So that's one form of scarcity that uh, that has had tremendous effects. Because of course, if you don't have if you don't have able to follow people up, they are going to be left alone for ages. With some cases being uh, documented for about ten years without without any follow up from the, from the government. And it's it's no surprise that that leaves people desperate, and desperate people do generally make worse decisions. So so that predisposes them to crime. And this is this is obviously just one one side of it, and there is an elephant in the room that I think might be worth discussing <clears throat> separately at some other time, which would be militant Islam. But uh, but there's absolutely other sides to this issue, such as for example that there's simply not enough manpower in the system to, t to take care of this many migrants. Right. Yeah, so we'll cover uh, ISIS uh, in a bit because that's definitely something to, to talk about. I'm um, going over my notes as well. Uh, so one of the other things they talked about in the thing is a lot of these, because these migrants uh, had the dream of, you know, this land of abundance that could take care of them, provide better opportunity than they were back home, is economic migrants. But what is the result of this? Well, Europe isn't this land of mass abundance. Uh, you know, if you import more than you have abundance to provide for, um, then obviously you're going to find scarcity issues. So they were pushed back to be homeless and the traffickers actually suggested, um, you know, destroying your papers, things like that. So they can't prosecute you. Uh, so they can't deport you because you want to stay in the land of abundance. So you want to make sure you stay there and you don't get deported. So they destroy the papers, but if you end up homeless now because there's no work, there's no way of providing jobs for you, um, it does condemn you to not just the lower class, but the homeless class, the forgotten class. Um, and this is problematic. Uh, many of these migrants, they had successful businesses back home or even just lives where they weren't homeless. Um, so they really regretted coming. Um, and the other thing as well is about the the corruption. So you know, the terrorists, uh, the NGOs, the traffickers, uh, the governments, uh, there was ties between them uh, working together. Um, and yeah, so scarcity comes in various forms, ranging from insufficient housing to inability to follow up migrants' cases, with some of them being left alone up for up to 10 years, making some migrants desperate and predisposing them to crime, as Trigger yeah, said. Yeah, that's what I added, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, so you have this documentary providing an accurate assessment, and then you have this like a, a much more detailed analysis of the situation. This is something I called out in the previous thing, which is, and also my big criticism against the Unabomber manifesto, which is that before you shoot someone, do more research to make sure your arguments are the best arguments possible. 
um, which is to go into the social sciences, which is to go into statistics, which is to go into investigative reporting, because you can only make a real solution or real change if your assessment of reality is congruent with reality. Yeah. Not to mention uh, death is a one-way street. Right. Yeah. There's no turning around from that, especially for Brenton. He's now life prison sentence. So he better hope to hell he made the right choice. However, there's many other alternatives, yeah. right? So and people that died, of course, are lost forever. Right. We never know what yeah. they could have done positively for the for the world. Right. And even as well, helping uh, reduce the demand for migrants or whatever it is, like, or in providing economic uh, opportunities. So what is these um, alternatives? What, what's the alternative to just shooting immigrants, right? Um, so, or rather, what does shooting immigrants try to do? So pretty much... Uh, uh, in in the manifesto, uh, Brenton again he says, "Is the birth rates is birth rates is birth rates." Well, in other words, uh, it's the alternatives to that would be well, it's scarcity, is scarcity, is scarcity, but also it's the traffickers, traffickers, traffickers. So how do these things um, tie together? Well, the migration is caused scarcity issues and it's caused by conflict and distrust, and that is turning people against each other. Um, Europe felt comfortable because it had perceived abundance from its upper classes, decision makers. And that led to widespread scarcity among the lower classes. So it's the upper class that decide, hey, we've got abundance in our own lives. Let's import the migrants, right? But the lower classes, they're facing scarcity every single day. Um, so there's a disconnect there with self-governance and um, those other uh, axioms that I talked or pillars that I talked about in the previous thing. But First, well, let's let's just um, try and so we've got the the alternatives in several categories. So first, we've got improved conversation, reduce demand, reduce supply, reduce supply and demand, and reduce demand and improve trade. So Brenton's solution was reduce demand by killing Muslims, creating fear, uh, or killing immigrants, I should say, creating fear, creating political instability reducing demand for migration into white culture that was his thing and that's it achieves that um however does it is it the best solution does it solve all the problems he's concerned about so let's go into some of the alternatives so first one improved conversation so locally concerned citizens should strive to make cases that emphasize factors like below rather than race such simplifications aren't necessary to make points it may lead to dismissal of more thorough criticism. So I raised this a little bit earlier. Uh, race is only a symptom of some greater uh, hatred or the way people look, uh, be it kinship or whatever it is. Um, these are all symptoms of something deeper because no one hates people for superficial reasons because they're superficial. What are the actual reasons? So the more we can get a better accurate assessment, the better we can solve these issues. So the better we can improve conversation, the, the more we can solve the issue well. So yeah. reduce demand. And, uh, so wait, hang on. On that point, uh, it's it's yeah. really kind of a shame that uh, it's the lower class in particular that uh, that suffer the most from the scarcity, because of course they have less access to training in t in the speaking, and so they're more likely to be poor at making the points that need to be made. That's uh that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, because I I see like um I was watching uh, some documentaries on Anifa. Uh, before this, like listening to Anifa's talks and speeches and things like that. And they are very much just like a mirror reflection of what they are trying to destroy in the same way that Brenton's manifesto is like a mirror of what ISIS is trying to do, which is ISIS, like, you know, there is militant threats and the way you combat militant threats is through militancy. That's the worldview. It's an eye for an eye ideology. Um, we talk about that in detail in the last stream. So if you're not able to make uh, coherent arguments or you know deal with uh, arguments with the complexity and delicacy they need, often one can get frustrated, viscerally frustrated, enraged, um, and then they resort to these uh, axioms, uh, axiomatic attacks, and uh, act. Uh, you see this in relationships, um, which is people can escalate rather than de-escalate and, and discuss. Um, yeah. All right, so so one of the options or solutions is reduced demand. So what's the observation that Southern provided for us to make a more accurate assessment of this? Well, the migrants frequently regret moving. Uh, they've had the papers exploit, uh, destroyed. They've um, 
you know, encountered a, a, a journey of many tribulations, um, getting there, they've lost a lot. Some of them don't live. And when they do get there, they face a lot of the scarcity that they had back home. Um, yeah. and, and often they've put the serious debt and essentially made wage slaves in some kind of prostitution or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah, they can get exploited in, in yeah, just wage slavery or, or the other um, type of issues uh, that that people unionize and, and um, you have liberal governments hopefully there to protect um, the lower classes against. And uh, one of the other things as well is it creates a brain drain of the local economy. Um, so yeah. if you've got teachers and entrepreneurs and other people who are not lower class because the lower class can't afford illegal immigration. It's the middle and upper classes. It well, not the upper class. They're, they're fine being dictators or whatever. <laughs> but it's the middle classes who are these economic migrants, or the sons and daughters of these middle class people who are these economic migrants. Um, so keyword being economic. How, yeah. So how do how do how does it benefit the local economy if if they're moving? It's a brain drain. It's it's very similar to. Uh, Australians going to the US or China, like white collar working Australians. Um, there's not really that much opportunity in Australia. They can get three times the wage going to the US or going to China. So they move and they get way more resources. But then what? where does that leave China? So like that type of like economic nationalism is like a defense against that. So you're just like no immigration outside. We're going to keep all the smart people home. But then you have a redundant economy, which then becomes susceptible um, to to economies that are more specialized. And because a specialized economy earns more money, it's more vulnerable in an area. But if you maintain leverage, economic leverage, then you reduce your vulnerability. Um, you provide resiliency. So that's like Japan's approach. They had a redundant economy of peasants uh, going into World War II. Or go sorry in the 18th 19th century uh, the economic economy of peasants that by uh, your usa showed up with big boats and display of power uh japan was ashamed and uh uh of like okay how can we compete they're definitely going to be able to push us around so then they focused on mass industrialization um but they had a culture of Bush, uh, bushido ethic of uh individualism and self-sufficiency so trade was unusual to them because trade meant you were now dependent on other people, which was not desired in Bushido ethic. Uh, so the most unscrupulous people then kind of went into government. But you rise, uh, you whenever wealth happens, you have mass population growth. And then they had the issue facing the country of we have to emigrate out. Um, uh, so move our people outside of Japan. Otherwise, they will starve because there's not enough food in Japan. And they begged uh, like the world uh, politicians to like, hey, please let us emigrate out. And the Aussie uh, prime minister at the time was like, no, Australia is a white country. And then USA and uh, Canada kind of like cucked to Australia's um, worldview there because um, the Australian prime minister was very outspoken. And it left Japan kind of no choice but to have this war. Um, we cover this a lot in uh, the Berry talk, uh, World uh, Eastern World War II history. Um, we go into that in a lot more detail. So you, know, you have this um, industrialization and then the scarcity kind of uh, issue. Um, so uh, you, what you want, so that's a issue with the national economy. So then what did they do after they lost World War II? Well, then they decided, okay, well, let's build a specialized economy uh, that has a leverage. So that way the world will depend on us. And we see this with the economies of South Korea um, and Japan. They can't compete economically with China, uh, but they can become incredibly important to the global stages economy. So therefore, we're not going to attack Japan and we're not going to attack South Korea because we depend on them. The world depends on them. So that's you don't want to hurt your 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 friend your the people you depend upon because then you hurt yourself. So that's a way of where a global economy actually really works compared to a national economy. A national economy puts you at risk of a global competitorship, um, which is those who leverage the specialties of each other. 
and with Australia's economy because it uh, has this kind of national immigration thing, and yet we have to allow white collar workers to go outside. Australia is really struggling here. We have a lot of the talent go to the US or China where they get paid three times the wage and it doesn't provide a economy locally. So you can say, well, let's bring them home. But then you're now providing redundant jobs compared to specialized jobs that China and USA could provide. So it can be better actually for, hey, well, why don't the companies provide a global workforce where an Australian could get paid USA wages, work for a USA company, but then put that money in locally. Um, so this is uh, a, a really good thing about the modern economy, a modern global economy, which is you could work for foreign companies, spend the money locally, empower your local communities. You don't have to physically relocate and then bring all that money elsewhere. And uh, you can also, uh, with global trade, facilitate increased dependence, but also increase resiliency and leverage with each other. It's a strengthening thing. Um, so what's, a, what's kind of the solutions here? Um, so I covered a lot actually uh, in that, but one of the things would be send the migrants back, even if they don't have papers, uh, send them back. Uh, so that way they can spread the word of how shit it was uh, for them and that Europe isn't this golden land of abundance that they see in the movies, uh, that the Western propaganda outputs to them. Uh, but the NGOs the told them. Is, yeah, that the NGOs, the traffickers, the governments make it out to be. That Europe isn't that great. It has its issues. Or the white culture as well, it has its issues. Like, kind of do what America successfully does to the rest of the world. I'm not sure if it's the same thing in Europe. But in Australia, whenever we hear about America, we're like, Jesus. It's like, there, there, there were all the... <laughs> uh, we have a negative opinion of America over in Australia. Um, it seems like we're... They run, run a lot of social experiments, let's say, uh, and provide mm. entertainment for the rest of the world. They're kind of like the reality TV show of how to run a country. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, comparison yeah, to... Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we can send the migrants back. And there's actually a fascinating movie a Bollywood movie of all things uh, that talks about this issue uh, as actually like a tangential plot line. Uh, Street Dancer 3D with all these sexy people dancing. Uh, fantastic um, movie. Look at those abs. Look at those dance moves. Um, it's fantastic. So these are upper class Indians um, and Pakistanis um, who live in England. And uh, they engage in street dancing at some very fashionable schools. Um, and there's the boy who is obsessed with, is this it? It's one of the street dancer movies. Yeah, I think it's this one. I don't know. I hope it's this one. But it's one of the street dancer movies with these main actors, right? So we have this guy here. He's kind of this mug guy. And then we have the girl who's a bit more self-aware. Um, and the girl ends up kind of walking around and end up finding out like, okay, there's some mass scarcity um, that is in Europe. Uh, sorry, in England. Uh, oh, not mass scarcity. There is scarcity that is affecting the lower classes. She sees a lot of Indians and Pakistanis begging for food um, outside the club where they just throw pizzas and throw hamburgers at each other for fun. So like their waste becomes like the leftovers for the starving. Um, and this is like a real thing with like the dumpster diving communities in Europe and like the squatting communities. They understand that, you know, the middle and upper class have this tremendous scarcity that needs to be leveraged better to provide for the lower classes. And they end up asking like, well, why are you here? And one of the, the smug character actually participates in some of the trafficking of a few of these people who were band members and he ends up seeing that these band members have ended up in a life of extreme poverty. And he has to deal with like, shit, sh sh how much responsibility should I take for this? Um, and it's a very confronting movie um, for the characters and a lot of personal growth for them. And in the end, um, uh, they kind of work together as part of this charity that they promote uh, quite deeply at the end to kind of 
hey, let's uh, work and, and provide food for these people to kind of ease the suffering while we work on helping them uh, emigrate back into the homelands, which they desperately want to do because life wasn't full of opportunity for them in the same way that a lower class European doesn't have opportunity in Europe or a lower class Australian doesn't have that much opportunity in Australia. Being in the lower class fucking sucks. That's why there's Marxists, right? <laughs> uh, and why there's capitalists, right? <laughs> like this pursuit of happiness. That's like the capitalist solution to it. Or the Think and Grow Rich by uh, Andrew Kine uh, by uh, Napoleon Hill. Um, so yeah, it sucks. So getting them, uh, sending them back to a sending them back helping them uh go back uh is is a good way because then they can help reduce demand this false demand that was given uh to them um yeah. and keyword there being help representation right keyword her being help yep uh so the other one is well you reduce supply and uh so the demand aspect is well migrants are demanding to go to europe the other way is supply. So we prevent their access to Europe or, you know, to the Western world. So stop illegals at the border uh, legally so, and return them. Um, and in the documentary, there is footage of this. Um, so you, the government isn't really doing that much. So you have private military in Eastern Europe, which is a very big thing, uh, actually engaging in um, this stopping and deportation. Um, and this is Australia's approach to uh, migrants. We do not accept illegal migrants. You come illegally, you get put in a detention camp. Those detention camps may not even be in Australia. They may be overseas, like in Navajo or Papua New Guinea um, or Papua. Uh, and it is not uh, pleasant in those camps uh, to an extent because they do get crowded and overpopulated and because these are not nice people. It's very much the same type of documentation that happens in the movies. Um, so. And there's a brilliant call where Trump is talking to um, the Australian Prime Minister that's been put into a newspaper as like a um, thing where they're debating immigration policies. And the, this is right after Trump goes in office and the Australian Prime Minister is saying, hey, look, Trump, uh, I know that your campaign was all about anti-immigration. However, you need to take uh, 5,000 of our migrants uh, because... Uh, Obama signed this thing to say that you would. And uh, I know that sounds annoying. And Trump was like, what are you talking about? My whole campaign, blah, blah, blah. And then, and he's like, why do I need to do this? And the prime minister is like, well, Obama signed it. There's nothing you can do. It, it's just what's happening. And he's trying to like, you know, uh, lubricate or soften Trump up to the idea. So they start discussing policies. And the prime minister is saying, look, these people uh came over they're they're the best of the people that's why we're sending them to you uh you know they're criminals and everything we're just sending them back home or keeping them in the detention camps but you know the doctors and all the rest we're giving to you because of the un is forcing us to actually not send them back you know, blah 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 diplomacies blah 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 yeah uh, so we're giving them to you and he's like well if they're so good why don't you take them um, and the prime minister responds back and says, well, Australia's policy on migration is we do not accept illegal immigrants. We have a zero tolerance to that because um, it reduces demand uh, by reducing the supply. Because if you completely eliminate the supply, which is successful uh, immigration of illegals, then there stops being demand because there stops being hope that you will successfully immigrate in. Um, so by reducing supply, you also reduce hope, um, which reduces demand. Um, and that has worked quite well in Australia. We do have migrants and they come over legally. We also have a something like a few hundred refugees or a few thousand refugees that were obligated by the UN to receive. Um, but that's overall the policy and it works quite well for Australia. Um, so that's that's another uh, avenue, which is just send them back at the border. It reduces demand. And this is the thing. If, if, so even if you're saying, well, that's, that's unethical, everyone should have a global citizenship, things like that. Well, the issue is if you just allow uh, uh, global citizenship without respect for like a self-governance or re without respect for the scarcity of a community, 
then you will end up having scarcity and then you'll end up having revolution. So you either have the choice of, hey, let's deal with this situation properly, which is the legal route, which manages scarcity well, which reduces the hardships that lead to revolution, or you incur bloodshed of revolution, which is the Brenton Terrence thing. So if you have mass importation of migrants into Europe, you will have revolutionaries who want to kill them. That's just the, the way it'll go down. So if you don't want killers, uh, you need to need to actually stop the, the supply of their cause of concern um, as well, um, rather than just hoping you can lock them all up. It, it's the same type of thing with um, probably any, like m many different issues that that line of thinking applies to. Yeah. Uh, so our next point is reduce supply and demand. So a big part of this is expose to corruption, shut down the NGOs, stop demand for funding them. The NGOs are largely funded by government, by charities, uh, by uninformed citizens uh, of these issues. So if you can call out the traffickers, stop the traffickers, stop the NGOs from cooperating with them, just make it well known so people propaganda. will support it. Yeah. So stop, stop, uh, inform people of the issues so they don't support these illegal practices, these dodgy practices. And like, this is very akin to um, like the same thing, like uh, the quote by, I think, Paul McCartney, which is like, if abattoirs had glass walls, there probably would be more people who don't engage in, in animal consumption. Um, so, mm -hmm. and it's also the same thing for World War II. Like no one really took the Holocaust seriously until photos came out. Right, which is until people see consequences of their actions and of the actions that they fund or perpetuate by their um, compliance or complicitness, um, then they're not going to relate or have a significant experience enough. So, like at least for myself, uh, 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 personally, I'm a vegan because I'm against uh, uh, animal cruelty or unnecessary animal cruelty. I'm for animal cruelty when it's necessary, but I'm against unnecessary animal cruelty. So sometimes, I, you know, I'm perplexed and, and I have to decide whether or not I should uh, buy something that has, um, you know, animal cruelty involved. And I just go through the thought process or like when I have a temptation, now I don't have any temptations of being vegan that long. But, you know, I would go through the thought process and I would imagine what would happen to the animal if I bought this uh, or the risk of what could happen. Um, and then by having that experience, then it brings the accountability, the consequence of this benign transaction of buying this product at a supermarket, it brings a consequence directly to the decision-making process. And this is incredibly important um, for reducing corruption. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for disproving um, the... Uh, shit what was it called um it's something like where the uh oh the tragedy of the commons so she disproved the tragedy yeah. of the commons she said it was just a um like a a projection but it wasn't actually true it was a social theory but it wasn't tested and she tested it and, and came to conclusions and what she found is actually the tragedy of the commons isn't true you can actually have more anarchical uh or or solutions to um, property management, but you need a property management and you need to, the, the main important thing is you put it down to like seven tenants or something. But one of the tenants was uh, you need to get the consequences of decision-making as close as possible to those who are, are responsible for the decisions. So for instance, if you have government manage uh, national parks and things like that, um, the consequences are kind of far out because then you just have democratic voters and things like that trying to make decisions of things they don't particularly understand. Uh, whereas if you have private ownership, it is actually managed very well in the same way we take care of our private properties of our houses or our homes um, because we're closer to the consequences. Um, and if you have a tribal community or you know managing the situation, they form negotiations with each other on how to manage the thing well. You don't need an authoritarian uh, instantiation you just have to have the people who manage it actually be responsible for it so in short um, you need people to have skin in the game right 
Yep, which is uh, like Nicholas Taleb's uh, uh, essay or book, um, or triad. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you expose the corruption, uh, you'll have more informed uh, citizenship because, again, one of the criticisms of democracy uh, is its mob rule. And if you have an uninformed mob, then democracy is inherently unhelpful and it becomes a toy for the uh, elite. And that elite is corporate or crony or corrupt or government or whatever it is. It's just elite, like, you know, the Illuminati, the 1%, whatever you want, right? The ones who influence the dumb sheep of the whatever it is. Um, you know, those all those conspiracy theories that have a nugget of truth to them. And again, that's why, like, the Marxists and the communists and, and more left-leaning uh, uh, politics actually engage in revolutionary stuff because they're opposed to systemic corruption. Um, so more informed consumers uh, will make better decisions, will less be less prone to manipulation by corrupt elites, and you will reduce supply um, yeah. by stop funding it, stop engaging, and actually increase uh, successful persecutions against the traffickers. Instead of it being, oh, these traffickers um, are you know, fighting for the migrants instead of realize, actually, no, they're displacing people, they're hurting the local economies. They're, harming they're abusing the migrants, countries. really. Yeah. You need to show how they abuse Mig the migrants to show how it's actually an immoral practice. Right. Right. And it's very similar to like Breaking Bad. Like in Breaking Bad, you see like the production of uh, methamphetamine. Um, but you also see like the dire consequences of it. And that show did a very good job at connecting consequences of the drug trade with um, the the success of the drug trade, um, which is which is really really good. Um, alrighty. So and one of the so the next point is well let's reduce demand and improve trade. So give the economic migrants jobs in the home countries. Uh, this is the tenant I proposed in the last. Uh, Thing called a borderless economy so by improving the local economies to where they can have digital jobs or just going over there improving their local jobs at the local economy so that they don't feel they need to migrate for work this is likely to be difficult due to pre-existing corruption um and trigger's gonna talk a little bit about that yeah the the thing is that the corruption in the system is going to punish any kind any kind of honest attempt at making something work because of course it's going to be competing against corruption that will likely be cheating to, to get rid of the rid of the competition if it's if there's any any real threat to it. So competing with corrupt is definitely a risky business. And especially when you're trying to make people cooperate, you need to you need to make sure they're on the same page. If someone is not on the same page, if there's little if there's a low trust environment, which it's likely to be in their home countries, hence why they're trying to migrate from in the first place. It's probably not going to work right away. So you need to be willing to risk your risk yourself to make it work. But if enough people try it, it's going to work. This is uh, fascinating because there is a uh, series on Amazon uh, Prime uh, called "Dicing with uh, Death." Let me share my Google Chrome. Um, yeah, "Dicing with Death." So what they do in this TV series is uh, they follow like truck drivers all around the world. So like he's a truck driver in Myanmar, a truck driver in Peru, a truck driver in Kazakhstan, a truck driver in Mozambique, a truck driver in, in Australia, East Timor, Tanz, Tanzin, Tanz, Tan, Tanzania. Tanzania. <laughs> Tanzania, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's fascinating. Like they talk about like the initial seasons, they talk about how much money they earn. Um, so you have an awareness of the economy. Um, in the last seasons, they stopped doing that and they actually dubbed it rather than using subtitles. They made decisions in the later season that kind of made it more like a dumbed it down for a more general audience, which was infuriating to me. I found the first few seasons fantastic because it actually shared economic light and a in, you know and respect for these people. You don't get all the inflections from a dub as you do from hearing the actual accent with subtitles. Um, so. It was fantastic. And one of the things uh, with some of these country uh, things in Africa, some of the things like they were always severely aware of corruption when they would go somewhere. They had to deploy security guards uh, to take them. And 
some of the uh, earlier clans or tribes um uh to no fault of their own like this is the thing like it's all about economics uh, i have a uh a, a theory or or whatever on that i've talked about several times on every quarter economic morality which is morality follows economics and you kind of see this where uh in this tv series where you would have uh say warriors or whatever that now they've been kind of domesticated and now they have to kind of do farmland and stuff but it's still a very difficult life just because of the harsh conditions of farming and whatnot so it's more economically profitable for them to provide for the necessities of their village to actually make the roads as horrible as possible through the villages so cars would get stuck and then they would demand money to help the car get out of the holes right. and the potholes and everything like that yeah and, that would be a great example said, of the problem right and then they said well what are you actually spending the money on and they were like soap like necessities like food and that's the thing like if there's no jobs you have to invent jobs uh and this is what a lot of uh economic theory is actually designed to figure out which is how can we create positive incentives rather than perverse incentives right like how can we I uh, get people so you know so one of the great uh illustrations of a perverse incentive is like a broken window economics which is let's throw a break window so that way it provides jobs for the uh the repairmen and for the glass manufacturers yeah. and everything like that in australia we see this a lot with government sponsored buildings which is let's knock over a building to build a new one even though the previous building was completely fine uh or let's yeah. just like just build all these stupid monuments all over the city just because they'll create jobs over like 10 years or something like that it's just like temporarily Jesus, this is yeah broken window economics like so it, it, it creates perverse incentives and we don't want that we want incentives that actually reward and facilitate growth and innovation so yeah. we see this actually a lot in in europe or at least in my uh social circles a lot of uh programmers as i'm you know, software engineer uh, by trade, uh, I have worked in, you know, places like Berlin, which, you know, is a good hub for this, uh, like that whole type of thinking, to like work with refugees to teach them programming, like a skill uh, that is applicable anywhere in the world. Um, and, you know, so that way the 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 economic, you know, the, the refugee migrants um, will have jobs that they can then, you know, take wherever. Um, but, this is one of the things which pisses me off extremely about diversity initiatives, right? Like any diversity initiative that is like a minority identity, like fuck you, like seriously, like gosh, it's so sexist and racist. Like the reason why there's an issue with a minority is not because of the skin color, right? Like there is people in that skin color, in that minority who are going to be incredibly successful and there is ones who are pushed aside. There is people in the majority skin colors who have had fucked up lives, who have suffered incredibly, and who deserve some type of opportunity, right? Some type of compassion. Like, it pisses me off. Like, okay, so speaking of which, like, as an Aussie, right? Like, uh, in my personal experiences, I've had several amounts of trauma in my life, severe trauma, relationship issues family issues, things like that, you know, all the all the list of crap that can happen in one's life, right? And then I work in software engineering. Now, if you have a family, you can't migrate out easily, especially if it's like a broken family in terms of like, you know, stepchildren, all the rest. So you have families and this is something which is hard. So as an Aussie, I can earn three times more if I work in the US or in China. All right, there's no need why I should have to migrate out. It's a bloody digital work, which now that all the Americans have finally figured out because of COVID, good work, guys. Right, like, yeah, you can do knowledge work anywhere in the world. Yeah, good work figuring that one out. All right, so instead they would want you to relocate, but then it's like you can't really leave your family behind. And even for like talks, right? I would get accepted for many different conferences to give talks about my work and then they would deny it. Why? Because it's cheaper to fly over 10 local Europeans or 10 local USA than one cost from Australia, right? 
So I miss out on that opportunity to spread my work. And then there will be like diversity funds and I'll be like, okay, let's put it towards these other people. And these other people may not even have such a bad life compared to the lives of other people. And especially like I went to the Node.js Interactive Conference in Amsterdam and I was spoke to like Japanese people and they were like, yeah, to participate in the open source scene for the Japanese, they had to leave their country. They had to learn English. They had to break up with their family and their girlfriends to go to a new country just to be able to participate in the scene, right? And yet they don't categorize as a minority group. Stupid. Like focus on people who have had experiences that put them in shit situations, right? Like empowering someone with the skills of programming shouldn't be racially segregated. It should be focused on who needs it and who has the opportunity to make the most impact. You give yeah. it to some people who have the most opportunity, they can then give it to people who then teach others and go back to their own areas. Don't do it over arbitrarily superficial things like skin color. It pisses me off. Yeah. If you want to solve a problem, solve it everywhere, not, not for particular groups at a time. Yeah. So how, how can we solve this, right? Like programming is, is a fantastic one, like, but Again, even with programming, like there is a difference in income rate of a Indian programmer versus a Western programmer. Why is this? Well, a Western programmer has a heritage of early experience with technology. They have technology throughout all of their life. They have more familiarity with it. They have more uh, acclimatization to technology in their decision making. Someone who grew up with computers at age and had to assemble them or whatever it is they're going to be a lot more gifted in that scenario and that's going to result in more economic leverage compared to someone who only encountered computers when they were 30 or 20 or whatever it is. The other actors, factors is nutrition. The other factor is economic stability or even political stability. So for instance, in India, there's power cutouts. There's all sorts of political, family, other issues that occur all the time that prevents someone from being successful. This is actually another issue why diversity is important. Um, or another issue where it's blinded by gender. So for instance, the tech companies, I hired all the white males, all of them, all the privileged white males, let's put it that yeah, way. They didn't hire me. Right? And then uh, they ran out of privileged white males to hire. So, okay, well, 50% of the population are women, let's hire all the women, right? But then the thing is, well, women want more flexible working hours because generally they, they work at home, they have families, they have an attachment to their children. Um, and they have a, a history of whatever causes, whatever you want to strive them to, it doesn't matter for the point, of having incentives where they are rewarded by looking after the children, be it personal, biological, uh, cultural, whatever it is, right? Now, some men, definitely, they do want to stay at home and look after the kids, right? And again, if you come from a family where there is people with mental issues or, you know, hardships and family you also as a man or whatever gender or color you are you also need reasons where you can't have that flexibility of work some days you're you know things could go wrong and you need to take the day off right so all these things done to hire women also benefits to all people who share the same uh marginalization right so this you know women are the largest demographic in that they are the majority demographic but there is marginalized people who suffer the same issues right um that is focused on there so so what's the point there well the point is well if we can uh create a working culture that can a borderless economy right that can hire people uh and create opportunity anywhere then that's fantastic programming is uh, fantastic for that but then alternatively you can do what the gen x's did right like fly there and actually help build the communities up. Stop sending money to corrupt NGOs who are just going to perpetuate the issue. There's countless documentaries about that. Said so go there and actually help them. And it's not just go there. I, I met when I lived in Malaysia. I've traveled a lot and lived long term in many Asian countries. Um, in Malaysia, one of the friends I have, he worked um, to... Uh, as a social worker and he would build villages for um, some of the uh, minority uh, groups who still live tribally in Malaysia 
And he one day he, he got fed up because he was building homes for them, like modern homes. Um, and they just sat around and watched. They didn't help. And he got infuriated. He, uh, you know, built one too many homes that was just abused and taken advantage of um, and uh, uh, delipulated, uh, you know, uh, fallen apart from a lack of maintenance. And he got fed up and he's like, you build your own fucking homes. Um, and it, it's hard. So you need to actually kind of help them, uh, you know, become like, you know, teach a man how to fish rather than giving them fish. Right, like giving people money doesn't solve their ability to acquire money. And this is another thing, like the most successful people, I wish I realized this earlier. This is something I only learned like th three years ago, which is I looked at all the successful people I wish to emulate, like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, whatever it is, right? What are the things they had that I did? Well, one is they were in a land of opportunity, must deliberately move to the US from South Africa because the opportunities in the US, he had the privilege of being able to do that. Right, he didn't have things that weighed him down in South Africa to yeah. prevent him from the privilege of yeah. partaking in brain drain. Right, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and but what's something they had? And what I realized was okay, they had engineering, they had a found grasp of economics, and they had um, a found grasp of philosophy. So it was like economics, <laughs> philosophy, and engineering. That's what they had. And so I was like, okay, I'm great engineer. Why am I so successful in business and everything? I lack philosophy and lack economics. And then holy crap, when I studied economics, man, did I realize how much I was failing in my life for completely obvious reasons. Like trying to get rich from making open source software, like you completely remove any financial incentive because people pay for something that is of scarce, of well, what is valuable is something that is scarce of, benefit and is scarce because if there's no scarcity then there's no need to pay for it if there's no benefit you get from it then there's no need to pay for it people only pay which like their money is a scarce resource they only trade scarcity for scarcity when that scarcity has a unique benefit um function that is also scarce right so function. i i have yeah i have a little quora answer which is like what really is an open source contribution and it's just like when two thousand dollar a year salaried evangelists convince uh, uh, losers to sacrifice the scarcity of their time to further the corporate interests of the company to further their recruitment efforts of an assimilated workforce using assimilated technology, right? Like that's harsh. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but that's what it is. Like the evangelists are just using it as like hiring potential and then a free workforce like you should work on something that offers unique benefit and unique value to people right like unique yeah. mass value but to bring this um, back a bit you said you said that uh something like that you thought uh, morality followed economics yeah yeah i will add to that that economics follows trust and uh, it's the trust that is that disappears when you make uh, when you make moves like the one that Brenton suggested. <laughs> mm. And it's trust right. that is absent in the in the countries that people travel from usually. Mm. So the question okay, is how so to build trust. So that's interesting. So maybe that's like the nugget and truth, of like with the people who are like love is the answer, right? Because the thing is, you can't go to Brenton and then be like, hey. Hey guys, or like you can't go to ISIS, right? Like you can't go to Raqqa and then be like, yo, ISIS loves the answer, right? No, you're going to get shot smack in the face and then beheaded and then have your head stuck on a pillar, right? As you can trust example, them to do that. Yeah. Like watch the documentary City of Ghosts. Like if you doubt anything I said, like Jesus, or go to like a website like livelykebestgore.com. Like, the world is like unbelievably vicious, right? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Anyway. Yeah. Um, to build yeah, trust, so, you need to put yourself at risk. Yeah. So this, so that may be like, but that could be the nugget of truth, right? Which, which the love is the answer people are trying to get, which is, it's more like maybe trust is the answer. Uh, maybe that's what they're going for. Because I, I find, what, I've been trying to document what love is, and I did a tweet now, but it'd be deleted because I auto-delete my tweets now to avoid, like, 
not to avoid repercussion for what I say, because I believe in what I say. That's why I tweet it. But to avoid the um, data collection concerns that Snowden and uh, whatever talk about, I don't think any government should or any company should have that much power to surveil its population. Um, and people could analyze tweets for nefarious purposes. Um, so that's why it deletes. But one of my tweets was, um, love is a virtue signal to show that two partners are on the same team. So when people are on the same team, I, I don't know what I said. So we'll just pick it up here. I, I have to trim that silence out. Okay. With technical difficulties, Zoom set my microphone to zero. Uh, like the volume for my microphone and my headphones is zero. So no one heard what I said. So we'll pick it up here. I don't, I don't remember what I said and there's no recording uh, for that. So we'll just continue. I don't know. I will, we'll yeah. hand it over hand it over to uh, yeah. you to pick up anything that you, you thought is interesting. Yeah. So one of the last things that I got that we got to was the whole thing about building trust by putting yourself at risk. That, that's how you do it. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see any other way to do it. If you don't put yourself at risk, you don't show that you have, that you're willing to, to put any effort into something. And uh, that effort inevitably comes with risk if people want to exploit it. You're setting yourself up for the game theory situation in which people can take advantage of or, co or cooperate. And obviously cooperation is preferable long-term, but short-term you're at risk. And it's a short-term that you have to deal with when you're, when you're trying to build something in an environment that is, that is already predisposed to cheat. So when you have lots of corruption already, it's, ex it's extremely risky. But if you don't do it, it's not going to get any better. And the thing is, you need to get as many people to, to do that as possible if you want any chance at getting it to be getting it to improve. So let's say getting the trust foundations to improve so the economy can improve so people can get a better morality to tie it all together. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we've got uh, lack of trust, project management, cross talk. Uh, give people self government, stop cities from enforcing their own culture into rural yeah. areas. And the way to uh, do that. The way to do that whole thing is through creating close-knit subcultures in the corrupt areas that can function independently from corruption. So they don't suffer because people don't cooperate, because they avoid people who don't cooperate. Mm. And uh, right. we might cons it's worth considering if that's something we could train people to do, teach people how to do right. practice. Right. Yeah. And uh, so one of the... Um... Interesting, because I, I don't recall what I said and what I didn't say, because I don't want to recover something that was actually captured. But one of the interesting things in this is uh, that we have notes for is that uh, there's the issue with Hong Kong right now. And because some aristocrats like a few centuries ago signed a document to say, hey, Hong Kong will become part of China in like 200 years or something. Uh, the Hong Kong people lose their culture. They lose their governments, gets assimilated in China. Is that fair? No, like why should some other people who aren't you get to decide how you should how your entire community and city should live their life and to some yeah. extent this was shown in the documentary with um the rural island uh the decisions of how they should live and how they should handle uh their communities is being made by people who live in cities um the migrant decisions are being made by people who are living in cities because they control the majority of voting because there's a lot more population in cities than there are in rural areas. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't seem, that's not a good solution because it avoids accountability. Um, what it, it distances um, uh, the consequence of decisions with those who make them. So self-governance is great, great uh, thing for this because self governance also allows to maintain a ship of contextual culture. Now, that's not to say, like, hey, let's all have um, ethno states and all that, because you also have to do it in a way that provides that collaborative wisdom um, that I've talked about uh, before, which is a movement from uh, isolated wisdom to collective wisdom to collaborative, because collective is just being uh, captured by the ideology and the cult mindset. Um, it's the wisdom of the mob. Right. So uh, what you want is you want collaborative wisdom with a, a contextual culture uh, that has self-governance. Um, and then you'll have something that is real. And, you know, that seasteading is a great example of this, like, which is trying to achieve this. 
Um, Liberland is like another one. But we see Israel is like another example of this, right? Um, and to some extent, they raise this in the documentary, like where kind of uh, uh, rural Ireland is kind of like Hong Kong and Dublin is kind of like China. And the lady kind of said, well, do the Irish have the right to Ireland? And this is very similar to like, well, do the Hong Kong people have the right to Hong Kong or do the Jews have the right to Israel? Now, Israel is kind of hard because it was just like after World War II, it's just like, hey, the Jews are going to go there. And then all the Palestinians were like, ah, uh, what? Um, <laughs> so it was kind of like uh, a little bit more issue there. But, you know, what does she mean by Irish? And I don't think she's doing the superficial skin color thing. Like if you've been a black person living in Ireland for a few centuries or whatever, like by all means, culturally, you're Irish. So And it's I culture that matters right. there. Yeah. So it's like, like when, if you've just come in there as a migrant and you know, you're not resembling the culture at all, then that's a problem. So this is again, like for Australia, our migration, our legal migration, you go through a values test and we see how well you will gel with the culture of Australia. Because if you have importation of, uh, subcultures that do not gel you have issues you have assimilation issues you don't get hired you get marginalized you get all these issues when if you can assimilate to the culture you will be able to integrate because there is trust um, and that trust is important and you know you will have and with the ability of self-governance you'll be able to have that fraction where hey the lefties can have their lefty state and the righties can have their righty state or you know the anarchists can try their anarchy experiment right you can build these little communities of trust where they're no longer having a revolt against each other's perceived aggressions. Um, and that will be a great win because, as I said uh, in a few, I, I crossed this series of propaganda manifestos, which is like democracy was a great solution uh, at, for feudalism. Feudalism, the minority ruled and oppressed the masses when m democracy, the majority oppresses the minority. And that majority can be influenced by uh, mobs or by, you know, elite people who are influencing uninformed people because it's hard for any one person to know everything that they should do. That's why we have specialized professionals. Um, yeah. And, and that's why the economy is based on specialized workforce. Um, not to mention constitutions. Yeah. Right. So a liquid democracy tries and solves like a lot of the issues there. But a liquid democracy is also just the step towards um, further self-governance. Um, so a liquid democracy is things like delegated voting, easier voting, more voting. Because the, one of the reasons we have voting every four years is because it costs like millions upon millions of dollars to hold a vote because it's such an inconvenience to the economy. But if voting could happen at any time and just happen digitally, like it, it becomes very costless and very seamless. And you could just say like, Hey, I know a lot of things about this, but all the things about this, I delegate to this person. All the things about this, I delegate to this person. All the things I know, you know, about this, I delegate to that. Just let me focus on the things that I feel like I know. Then that decreases the cost of voting. Voting can happen more. You can get more feedback. You can make better decisions as a democracy. Yes, um, but that hinges on a problem, and the problem is trust and the the, the, the how vulnerable it is to hacking. Right. And uh, so these are these are issues, uh, but these are these are experiments that need to run and, and be improved upon. Like it's an area where there's a lot of innovation um, to be beckoned and, and solved. So, so we need a society that can kind of trust each other, and we do that through move from isolated wisdom and collective wisdom to collaborative wisdom. We do that by kind of respecting our cultures. Not like one of the issues as well is like like. Western Australia, Perth, where I grew up, it's very close to Bali. It's, it's cheaper to go to Bali in Indonesia than it is to go anywhere else in Australia. A lot of uh, yeah, gentrification of Bali has happened from Australians. Uh, and also the miners, they spend two weeks in the mine, two weeks off, and their two weeks off is at Bali because the quality of life there is way better. And I've seen like the gentrification of Bali over the years. My dad first went there in like the 70s when it was just like a few villages. I um, mean, like there was no bitumen roads and things like that. Um, and he's seen it transform and I've seen it transform dramatically as the M Europeans have now discovered it. Um, and it's always interesting because initially like it was Kuta, that was like the place you go. And then after Kuta was Semenyak, 
No, then it was Legion, and then it was Semnia. Now it's Chengu. Uh, so it's like, you know, these areas where all the tourists go, they're like, the tourists want the rice fields. So then they go where the rice fields are. And then, like, you know, close to the airport. And then that area gets gentrified. And now there's no longer any rice fields there. So then it goes to the next area, the next area. And then it just destroys, like, the, the previous area. But then all the people from Indonesia, are con- like, there's me- most of the people working in Bali aren't Balinese. They've migrated from the rest of Indonesia because that's where the money is. And then you have, um, like, in the northeast of Bali, you have fishermen um, who are getting engulfed by the gentrification of Ahmed, uh, one of the village, one of the tourist uh, spots there. And so what the uh, the fishermen are doing, because they're afraid that the their land is going to get bought up and uh, whatnot, is they play like really obnoxiously loud music on the fishing boats to kind of piss off the tenants of the hotels uh, to kind of prevent the uh, the gentrification. And I mean, this is good. It would, I guess in a bit, because again, it's like that revolutionary spirit to protect someone's interests. But at the same time, like these fishermen are like working for like a few dollars a day and they're having children to depend on the children for their growth. And they live in really extreme uh, poverty. And, and I have good friends who live in those villages. I've spent a long time living in, in Bali and engaging and I have really good friends there. And um, uh, they, uh, it's it's hard because they don't have education where they can easily get jobs so like when i go there when i go to bali my dad he first told me this was um when i went there as like a teenager he would always bring like over all the um reading glasses and just like any prescription glasses he could find like from uh like thrift shops um and just hand them out to people in Bali and people would cry because for the first time ever they've been able to see like something that isn't blurry even for prescriptions that aren't prescri- you know unique to their eyes but it's just an improvement yeah. and so when I go there I just like bring as like many secondhand phones as I possibly can because one of the things when I went there like I got a thing to Changu because I was attending like a co-working or like a what is it like a you know, millennial style, like, hey, let's work. I work retreat kind of thing over there. And um, I got like my little ride on like the little taxi, like the Uber they have grab over there. But in Indonesia, it's like little kids driving motorbikes. Like, and it was this kid and it was like maybe 13 or 15 or something. And he just had an iPhone or an, or an Android phone, like a smartphone. And that smartphone provided him a career where he could now feed his family right and that's fantastic so it's like a smartphone there like a little iphone that just an iphone 4 that sits in our drawers and goes unused is a career for someone in in the third world like that is unbelievably important and that is something that is empowered by you know things like grab or whatnot um really really crazy so now like i go there and i and i give people you know secondhand phones and who i think have the most opportunity to to use that and one of the restaurants, like I just added them to Google Maps. And because of the increased traffic now to their restaurant, then they're able to send their children to, to school. And now their son's going on to study agriculture. And they've been able to hire more employees for their restaurant just because of the increased discoverability. Like these are small little things we take for granted in the Western world that empowers their economy where they don't need to migrate out. They can make their lives better there and improve their economy there where people aren't starving anymore. And yet in those fishing villages, like those kids, like how the hell do you like for Google Maps? Like how do you get a, a official business list on Google Maps? You need to get a postcard mailed to you to verify your address. These villages don't even have mailboxes. They don't have postmen that go to the villages. Like it's such an oversight. Like how are these people going to escape poverty? Like when there isn't this type of opportunity, like an address is just something we take for granted. Yeah. Like, so, you know, instead I've just like added them to like Google Maps and it's just like, you know, it can kind of help. Like, it's not an official business, so they're not going to show up that much. They're not going to get priority results. But then hopefully, and they have gotten like a little bit more traffic where they can do like guided tours. Like, what is it like to be in a fishing village and, yeah. and you know, eat with locals, things like that. And in the meantime, they, everybody just has to deal with the fact that there is. That... That economic success, you might say, follows some kind of parallel graph. So, like this. 
it's mm. really hard to start, but it's easier the further you get. Right. Yeah. So that's something that, you know, people can go there. Like, then this is a great thing of gentrification. This is something I hope to see from like a global citizenship. Like as an Aussie, I spent uh, like a year of my life living in like Bali, a year of my life living in Malaysia um, and traveled a lot more through Asia. But in Kuala Lumpur, I can have a terrific quality of life. Same in Bali. And I can put funds towards them and I can send money back home to care for my family back home. So like, you know, as an Aussie living in, like, let's say in Sydney, like Sydney is one of the most expensive cities in the world. Like rent here is like two grand for like just the two grand a month for just like a two bedroom apartment. That's like an hour out of the city. Like it's ridiculous. Like, and it's a, like a rundown apartment, things like that. And like to get like a three bedroom apartment, like a nice area looking like at like a grand a week Australian. Well, like a grand, like a month in KL will get me like a brand new apartment with like a gym and a pool and, you know, in a like nice area and everything rather than a grand a week in, in Sydney. And so I can have a lot more money, a lot more capital that I can put to things I care about by living in KL. Now in Bali, in KL, they give you a three month visa unlimited when in, uh, uh, Bali, it's like a 30 day visa. And then to get something like a three month visa, you have to do a social Buddha visa. Um, uh, so it, uh, it, and you have to apply for that. You need to get permission, a lot of paperwork, a lot of mucking around. Um, so by, so what a lot of countries in Asia now are recognizing, um, is, Hey, digital nomads are fantastic for our economy because they, they gentrify the areas, they increase education, they help the locals out. They, um, you know, provide money, but then they also have money to send back home. So like Australia should also love this. Like Australia should love having the idea of sending, you know, these digital nomads to Asia because they have more capital. They can represent Australia better. They can do more. Like it is a bit of a brain drain, but it's better than like just working at Silicon Valley and being sucked into like the green card citizenship of the U.S. machine. Right, like mm -hmm. I'm still Australian if I live in KL on like tourist visas. Yeah. Right? Or... And to drive this back to the point of this whole stream, addressing the addressing Benton and Borderlands. Yeah. This would uh, this is kind of thing that could help deal with the problems in the places where the migrants come from, and thus make them less likely to come. And meanwhile, it doesn't kill anyone. That's kind of a big big deal considering the importance of lives and the. Whoever know whoever can even fathom how much is lost when when every person dies, we don't have any any way to grasp it really. Mm. So, right, so that that would yeah. be a good thing, like for uh, like increased tourism, like but to get like that tourism, like that gentrification, like the digital nomads who go to these countries like Afghanistan or uh, Libya, things like that. Then we need political stability there because a digital nomad doesn't want to go there and then suddenly like. Hey, there's no internet. Hey, there's no things. So it's still like yeah. a lot of work to be done to like provide some basic stuff there. But I mean, that's that's a lot more impactful than just donating to like NGOs. Is, yeah. Um, you know. So ways to do that help. might include training people in how to build uh, high trust communities in uh, low trust areas. Right. And uh, actually, there's a book about it. Like, if you do just want to send money. Uh, Peter Singer, a Australian philosopher, utilitarian philosopher, uh, he's got like utilitarian philanthropy. Uh, what is it? It's like he's got a website and it lists like um, charities by their effectiveness. Um, so like one dollar, like giving it to, like say donating food may not be as successful as donating mosquito nets, uh, things like that in terms of the actual impact. Uh, let me see if I can find his uh, website uh, for this because it's um, uh, it's fascinating. Um, you can talk while I, I find the website. Uh, but what should I say? <laughs> oh, okay, effective altruism. Um, there you go. That's the philosophy and the um, the the whole practice of it so i think uh if we search it's like a yeah it kind of explains it all um is there a website yeah effectivealtruism.org so that will list like charities by which ones are actually the most effective 
um, at producing this kind of empowerment and, and these positive outcomes rather than perverse incentives. Um, so, you know, these are, these are all great things to happen. And yeah, it's like, there's no need to have revolutions if you can solve the scarcity issue in great ways. Um, and there's ways to do that, that transcend superficial things like color and gender and all that nonsense. Culture. Yeah. And trust and yeah, culture either uh, as well. Um, all right. I think, uh, I think we can probably wrap this up here because, uh, besides what I probably lost in, in that bit, uh, lost in the bit that was silent, that would have been cut out for viewers who watched the recording. Um, I think, yeah, we've said everything we've covered it. So in, in summary, uh, you know, Brenton, he saw a problem, which is a destruction of his, uh, culture from a mass migration that created scarcity issues. And he wanted to reduce demand by increasing terror, increase, increasing, uh, instability. Now that is not a good solution because it doesn't actually solve uh, the scarcity issues. Scarcity issues happen even within one's own ethnicity, even within one's culture. Um, and they've happened for thousands of years in Europe. Uh, whites have fought around whites because of scarcity issues. Instead, you can work on things such as innovation to help go beyond the cycle of scarcity, or you can help do things which we've outlined here. So um, those things are, so for instance, yeah, improve conversation. Go from uh, competitive or isolated wisdom into collective wisdom. Discuss things seriously. Go beyond superficial racism and, and gender things and talk about what's actually marginalizing the, the what's actually causing um, the symptom or what's actually the causes of these symptoms. Like what is the causes of putting these people in the lower class? Um, yeah. And how can we be more informed people to vote and move our money around more informed citizens and consumers uh, and donators um, and reduce demand. So let's get the migrants who regret it, who want to go back home, back home. Um, let's work on that and let's kind of ease the suffering and also equip them with skills where they can participate in the local economies, which um, will improve their local economy, reduce demand, and then we can leverage their local economy. We can facilitate trade with the local economy. That's fantastic. Everybody wins with that. Yeah. Um, reduce supply, stop illegals at the border legally and return them to more strict borders. That, that works. That's, that works really well. Um, it's not the only solution, but it's one of the things for stopping this. And expose the corruption, shut down the, end, uh, the corrupt NGOs, and stop demand for funding terrorists for corrupt governments, for corrupt uh, NGOs. Um, that's good. And donate to more effective charities uh, instead. Uh, effective altruism is good that and yeah empowered um facilitate more in a borderless economy so that way you can leverage trade with more people uh that's fantastic everyone benefits from trade um it's 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 the thing that transcends all borders there's a great speech and network i talked about in the last uh last live stream or about that type of transcendence and um yeah improve their their local cultures by improving their economies but yeah, some of that, I mean, like it is true that there is issues there like cultural issues and maybe to some extent they are ethnic or genetic, but those are still things that can be improved over time um, because there's still a lot more to do before you go into eugenics. There's still a lot more that can be solved culturally and socially and economically. Yeah, such as and if you're still inclined to look at it in terms of uh, skin color or, or culture, remember you aren't your genes, you aren't your culture. The culture you practice is the culture that is yours. The rest is just something you associate with because it feels good. So what you should do if you want to preserve a culture is make people want to adopt it. Right. Yeah, that's great. Alrighty. Uh, so thanks everyone uh, for watching. Thanks Trigger for joining me so much and really valued your input. Uh, you can find all the details below in the description. And uh, yeah, we do these discussions weekly um, and really want to hear from you as well to facilitate that collaborative wisdom. Uh, all right, I'll end the stream now. And yeah, if you feel like you could have added more or better arguments, please let us know. Uh, yeah. Let me change that to you. One last thing. I'm very sorry yeah. for the lighting. <laughs> no worries, man. All righty.
Thanks so much.